recording so uh, hello everyone um, welcome to uh, a nature spot presentation uh, on uh, mollusks and uh, this is a talk that's going to be given by uh, Dave Nichols who is one of the trustees of nature spot uh, and he's going to be talking about getting to grips with slugs and snails so Dave uh, if I can hand over to you okay thank you very much um, well I hope I'm talking to people that are into wildlife recording and one of the reasons we oh, I'm quite keen to try and encourage more people to look at recording slugs and snails is because there are so few records of them. Um, at the moment we only have about 6,000 records uh, in total and so it means that there's a lot of species that are relatively common that we don't know that much about and they are as a, as a group you know, large, fairly obvious, and relatively easy to, to spot and identify in many cases. Of course, they're not all large, there's some really tiny little snails, but many of the common ones are, should be identifiable and easily recorded. And indeed, most of them can be recognized in the field without having any extra equipment. So what I want to do today is to run through the 10 most commonly recorded species and just try and make it easy for you to recognize them. The key with recognizing um, and, and confidently identifying anything is to really know what the lookalikes are. You might think it looks like the species that you're familiar with, but how can you be 100% certain? So one of the key things to look at, I think, is um, what could you confuse that species with and how can you distinguish it from uh, these, these lookalikes? One of the key uh, approaches that's going to help in that is to look for the important features. So with snails, there are four things to look at. And if you're taking pictures of snails and want help with identification, you could do with four different shots, all from these different angles. So the kind of the overall shape of, uh, of, of the snail, the profile, if you like, is important, a side on uh, shot. Um, then uh, a head-on shot, you know, the, in the opposite corner for, from the apex, looking from the, the pointy bit downwards. And then two subtle shots on the underside. One is the, the, the hole in the middle. If you think of a, a snail as a, as a tube that's wound um, in, 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 around and round, and there is a kind of often a hole between those wound tubes, and that's the... Um, the, the umbilicus that runs right through the, the, the center there. And then the aperture or the mouth of the snail, the shape of that is another key feature. So if you're taking pictures, then trying to get those, those four uh, shots would, would help. And now with a snail, and you've always got to remember that uh, snails, are, their, their most adhering side is the right hand side. And that's because that's the side that has the breathing pull. If you can see my cursor, uh, you can see the breathing pore on that uh, side of, uh, of the slug there. And there's often different patterning or colors around the edge of that. And also if you see on that slug here, this is uh, Arian hortensis, the black line above the breathing pore runs over the top of, of, the, of that pore. And that's a, another key feature. So uh, a side on shot from the right, uh, a dorsal shot looking straight down, but also looking at the sole. Quite a few slugs have colored or patterned soles. So it's important to have that picture. So let's uh, get stuck in. And you'll see as I run through some of the key ID features, I'll be re relating them to, to these different views. So I'm going to run through them one to 10. Number one, this is the most commonly recorded mollusk on nature spot is uh, the Kentish snail, Monaca cantiana. Interestingly, this isn't a garden species, but when you're out in the field, it's often very obvious because it likes to climb up vegetation, climbs up grasses and so on. And on a hot day, it will often um, kind of seal itself into its shell, but high up on a grass, so it stays obvious, whereas a lot of other species will try and bury themselves away to keep, to keep moist. It's a relatively large snail, and by that I mean you know, 10 to 15 mil. There's one or two larger ones and a lot smaller ones. It's relatively round, but crucially it has this mottled appearance, particularly when it's an adult. And uh, although there are other snails when they're juveniles that could be mottled, but uh, there's none that are of, of this size and are mottled. But also if you look at the umbilicus, the, the hole in the middle, you'll see it's just 
partially obscured by the lip of the mouth. That's another kind of feature to look at if you're not sure. So what could it be confused with? Well, as I said, none when it's an adult. But um, the juveniles could be, and this is true of the juveniles of many species, um, they often change their appearance as well as their size. And in this case, the juveniles are quite hairy. So occasionally people think it's the hairy snail. And as I said, other species such as the strawberry snail can also be mottled, um, but it's nowhere near this size. So if you kind of combine all of these features together, you should be able to identify that quite comfortably. So moving on to number two, one I'm sure you're probably all very familiar with. This is the largest snail we have in Leicestershire, the garden snail, Cornu aspersum. It's not the largest snail in Britain. That is the Roman snail, which is the same family, um, but nearly twice as big, it's huge. But unfortunately we don't have those uh, in VC 55. So this can, can grow up to 30 millimeters. It has this kind of characteristic tortoise shell, um, patterning on, on the shell itself and the body uh, has this pale stripe. You can just see it down here on, on, the, on the dorsal surface. You shouldn't really confuse this with anything. In fact, if it's an adult and it's that big, then there's nothing to confuse it with. But if it's a smaller one, then the only one that looks vaguely similar is the cot snail. And um, this has a similar kind of speckledy brown pattern but it's, it's a smaller species and it's found in a different environment. It's often in kind of um, woodland, hedgerows, grassland. And it, uh, I heard it uh, described as looking like it's polished oak. It has this beautiful, uh, very glossy textured uh, surface on it. And it has a single stripe running around the edge. So just the one single stripe. And crucially, it has a, an umbilicus that, uh, as far as I'm aware, is unique amongst all of our uh, Leicestershire snails in that it's slit shaped. It's not round like all of the others. So number three is the, the brown lipped snail. Now this comes as a pair. There are two superior species, the brown lipped and the white lipped. And we'll cover to the, come to the white lipped in a minute because that's the next uh, heavily recorded species. But this is slightly larger um, and crucially, as the name suggests, it has this brown lip on the edge of the mouth on the outside. And with mature adults, it's fairly obvious. And so if you see that, um, then you, 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 you're you certain that you've got the right identification. Um, just beware though, that it comes in different color forms. So you can have stripey, uh, non-stripey, kind of pink, yellow, brown. Um, as you can see here, there's, a, there's a, quite a, a variety of different colors. The number of stripes can vary too. And um, so the key common feature is that they've all got this brown uh, lip here. And it doesn't have an umbilicus. If you turn it over, um, the umbilicus is completely closed over. So what could you confuse this one with? Uh, well, of course, the color moths um, throw some people off. They think that they, they've got in their mind that it's a stripy snail. So if you see one of these plain ones, that might confuse you. Uh, of course, it could be confused with a white-lipped snail. And a similar size um, snail is the cop snail, which we've already looked at. One thing to be aware of is uh, juveniles don't have the brown lip. And also as they're growing, they, they grow from the lip onwards. Uh, and so the, the, the lip can be almost transparent when it's very, very new and it hasn't hardened. And so it can look a bit whitish but it, it's not, it's, uh, it's just a juvenile snail. And of course you do get some snails that are damaged and the lip has, has broken off, in which case you best just leave it and look for another one. So here's its, uh, its partner in crime, the, the white lip snail, very, very similar, comes in very similar color morphs, similar shape, quite round, could be stripy, could be plain, but crucially it has this white lip here, whereas the other one had the brown lip and that's common throughout. So if you see a mature snail um, that, that has this white lip, then again, you're fairly safe. Um, so you, if you didn't look for the lip color or the lip was broken off, as we say, then you could confuse it with the brown lip snail. Possibly on size, the cop snail, and as and, and like with the brown lip, juveniles can be a little bit confusing. So with a lot of mollusks, it's best just to look 
and record the adults. So the next one is uh, probably an animal that all of us are very familiar with. It's the one that comes out after it's rained and you see walking across paths. Can get very large, up to 10 centimeters, if not larger. And uh, like some of the other mollusks, it comes in different color morphs. So although it's commonly referred to as the large black slug, um, it comes in, in reds, yellows, browns, beiges. So you can't go on color. And uh, also, um, it's actually an aggregate of two species, the large black slug, Arenata, and the large red slug, Arian rufus. And they're impossible to tell apart visually. You have to dissect them. And so that's not something that most people are going to do. So for that reason, we record them as, as an aggregate, Arenata ag. And so um, you can't look for the color, but what you can look for is the fact that it has no stripes. This is true in the adults. Some juveniles uh, may have stripes. So if you see a large slug without stripes, then, then you're on safe ground. All the Aryans don't have a keel. The keel is like a ridge that runs from the tail forwards. Um, there are three main groups. There's the Aryans um, that don't have a keel at all. Um, there's one or two that we're gonna look at in a minute that have a very short keel, just here on the back. And one or two that have uh, the keels that run all the way up to the mantle here. Now, crucially, with uh, with with the uh, Arenata aggregate group, they have a, a stripy skirt at the base of the body that runs all the way around. You can see that quite clearly here on on this uh, reddish one. The fact that this skirt is brightly coloured, brighter than the body, is a strong indication that this one is in fact Arian rufus, the red slug but we can't be sure about it. So again, we'd have to just record it as the aggregate. So the only real confusion is with juveniles because having said it doesn't have stripes, juveniles might do. Again, it's another uh, species that's quite variable as it grows, but the adults are fairly consistent in their appearance. So number six, I'd say is the commonest slug. Um, makes you wonder why it's probably not recorded more uh, than, than the others possibly because it's a bit smaller and maybe because it could be confused with one or two others. Um, almost every habitat has this species. Gardens, it's, uh, it's very abundant. Woodlands, you'll find it. Um, you pick up almost any stone or log anywhere and you'll find it. I've even found it quite commonly in the middle of arable fields where there's hardly anything else living. It is one of the pest species. It uh, will, will, will eat living plant tissue, whereas a lot of the other slugs aren't really pests, they, they eat a, a wider range of material, including dead material, and so play quite a useful ecological function in recycling uh, dead vegetation. But the netted slug is quite chunky, particularly when you see it contracted. And uh, it's one of the species that has a very short keel. You can just about see that on the middle picture here, where it comes up from the tail and then peters out. And as the name suggests, um, it can be recognized in most cases because between the tubercles on the back, the underlying skin is darker. So it looks like uh, there's a net pattern um, on, on its back. And to help distinguish it from uh, other species or particularly the nearest looking one, uh, if you look around the paw here, you'll see that there is no difference in the color. So the one that it can be most commonly confused with is another common slug, um, the chestnut slug, Darocerus invadens. Um, it's a similar size, but often slimmer. And it can be found in gardens and similar habitats. But crucially, this species does have a white ring around the pore. You can see that quite clearly on this picture here. So if you compare the two, um, they, they look uh, quite different if you're looking at the right feature. Also, the interesting thing with uh, this slug, the chestnut slug, is that uh, I sometimes nickname it the racing slug, because if you turn over a stone or a log, whereas all the other slugs just kind of hide away and contract, this one does a runner and it shoots off. No, shoots off is a relative term in the slug world. Uh, it races off to the edge. So if you see um, you know, a whitish slug disappearing off, it's, chances are it'll be this one. 
It can, sometimes comes in darker colors, hence the name. Uh, it can be kind of browner as well, but there are quite white ones. So if you look at the top right picture here, you see it's a similar shape, but uh, the paw gives it away. So just, I just thought, well, are there any other kind of whitish slugs that you could confuse it with? There are a few other pale ones. Um, the Arianator aggregate that we looked at earlier, I said, comes in, in, in palish forms. There is a whitish version of that, but this has the stripy skirt that we mentioned. Uh, the tree slug, which um, you, you may find its uh, habitat is mainly ancient woodland, is, is very pale, has a watery look. But it does have these darker stripes and blotches. Sometimes they're more pronounced than you can see on that picture. And the greenhouse slug, which you can also see in the garden, starts off pale, but it always has these, these dark stripes. Uh, just out of interest, I took this uh, extract from the, the new feature we have on Nature Sport uh, species page is the ID aids, where we're gradually populating them with information that helps you to distinguish one species or the species you're looking at from its lookalikes, very similar to what I'm talking about today. So the next species, number seven, a uh, very common garden snail is the strawberry snail. Now on the face of it, this is um, just another brown snail, so it, you think it'd be quite hard to identify. But the fact that it is one of the most commonly recorded species tells you that there must be something about it that helps you to recognize. So it's a, it's a medium size. It's smaller than the other snails we've looked at. Maximum size is about 10 mil. And it, it is just dull and brown. It's not glossy at all. But if you look on that top left picture, you'll see very clearly it has these deep striations. So it's really rough looking. And crucially, and this is a, a key ID feature, if you look at the snail end on, and you can see that on the third picture here, it's not evenly rounded. It has a kind of what's called a shoulder on the, on, on, on the rim of the shell, which is often paler, it has this pale stripe on, as if it's kind of worn, worn off the, the color of the, of the shell. So um, that helps give it away. It's also got a large umbilicus, as you can see in the second picture there. And as I mentioned earlier, just be aware um, that it, it does come occasionally in these mottled varieties. But you see on that right-hand picture, although it's mottled, so superficially looks a bit like the first species we looked at, the Kentish snail, it, it has, it's flatter, first of all, and it has all these deep striations, which, which give it away. So non, uh, no other species has that combination of features. So again, with a lot of these, well, it's true of all species, really, it's not a matter of looking for one single feature. It's, it's ticking off two or three or, or, or more. The only other ones that you might come across that are vaguely similar, uh, the hairy snail looks brown until you look really closely and it's covered in hairs. Um, although those hairs can wear off uh, with, with older mature specimens. But this is much rounder. Um, and the other species, which isn't very common, but is spreading, is the girdle snail, which also has the shoulder with the white stripe around it. But in this case, it's, it's not really a shoulder, it's a keel. It's a very sharp um, edge to the, to the shell there. Okay, let's move on to number eight, uh, a very common snail in woodland, again, not so common in gardens. Um, it's, again, quite a, a smallish species. And just if you had to identify it on looks alone, we'd, we'd be struggling. It's, um, it's very shiny and glossy, and, but it's very similar to a few other species. But crucially, and this is the key feature to look at, if you pick it up, and smell it, you can smell garlic. So if you smell that garlic uh, and, and the snail is less than seven millimeters, then, then it's safe to record it as, uh, as the garlic snail. <clears throat> uh, there are two others to be aware of. Um, the, the one on the bottom left, Ega uh, Pinella uh, nitidula, the smooth glass snail is very common also in woodlands, probably more common, is slightly larger and doesn't have that glossy look. It has this kind of dull waxy look. Uh, there is a subtle difference as well uh, between uh, all of these Oxychilis species. If you look at the edge of this shell as it comes round, it's very tightly wound. So if you imagine that, that coil carrying on, it would just curve around. Compare that to uh, 
the smooth glass nail below it's got a much more trumpet shaped mouth so if you carry on this coil here it's kind of coming out down there it's not curving around so uh, that's often a feature that, that's, that's spoken of but i think it's quite subtle um, the other one is another oxychili species which is basically just a bigger version of the garlic snail the cellar snail um, but it grows not only does it grow bigger but it doesn't smell of garlic so if you find it uh, eight millimeters or bigger <clears throat> excuse me then it's not going to be the garlic snail and it's there's a good chance it's the cellar snail number nine is one of the easiest snails to recognize because it has this mottling on it which is unique the only trouble is it's quite small it's only about four millimeters long and if you find it in your garden there's a good chance it's covered in mud and so the mottling isn't so obvious but if you turn it over the other key feature which makes it pretty much unique is it has this very deep umbilicus it looks like a whirlpool uh, it's not only deep but it's very broad as well so you can see in that middle picture uh, how how big it is when it's compared to one of the tiny little snails we get in our garden uh, laura cylindracea they often come together actually so yeah it's only about four millimeters and then um so yeah sorry uh, with confused species if you see the mottling uh these deep striations and the size there's nothing that you're going to confuse it with so number 10 is another slug the the dusky slug um this one is um another arian so it's smooth without a keel this time it has stripes, not uh, like the Arianator aggregate that we looked at, which doesn't have stripes. And it has this kind of bright orangey yellow color. Um, it can be bright orange, in which case it's very obvious. Sometimes it can be more of a, a yellowy brown, as you can see more in the right hand side picture. But it has these lateral black or dark stripes along the edge. Um, and crucially, if you pick up a bit of slime from it. You can do this with your finger or if you find that uh, distasteful, then use a tissue and particularly rub the tissue or your finger on the tail of the animal. Um, that's where the slime gland is. It will <clears throat> release a little bit of slime and the slime is orange. So if you get an orange snail, orangey brown snail with orange slime, hey presto, you know what it is. So the only one <clears throat> there is a similar color is Arianata or the the orange version of that but that as we said earlier doesn't have any any stripes at all and it has clear slime not the orange slime so there you are there's the one to ten if you're interested these are 11 to 20. Uh, again most of them are fairly common uh, many of them in gardens the Irish yellow slug um, is very obvious um, the Budapest slug is the one that has the black stripe on the sole. So that's a good example of a species where you do need a picture of the sole because there is another Tandonia species that doesn't have the black stripe. So without that photo, you can't be sure. Uh, and there's a few um, aquatic snails coming into the list as we go down. But uh, I won't go through those. That's perhaps for a, another presentation. So I'll just finish by saying that if you want to uh, look into it a bit more uh, or you need some help, then uh, as you'd expect, I'd recommend you look at the Nature Sport Slugs and Snails Gallery, where we have uh, excellent pictures of all of the species you're going to find. There is a really good Facebook page on Slugs and Snails where you can upload uh, pictures and you'll get help, or you could email a photo to, to Nature Sport if you want some help. There are two really good um, Field Studies Council aid gap publications that are relatively inexpensive, one on snails, one on slugs, which I'd recommend. But there are some free keys uh, produced by Brian Eversham uh, that you can uh, download from Nature Sport if you go to the Nature Sport Slugs and Snails resources page. So I look forward to seeing lots of mollusk records from you all. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks very much, Dave. That was um, a great presentation. 
Um, I hope that's really um, uh, useful for everyone. Uh, what I would like to say is that if you're within Leicestershire and Rutland, we really would like your recordings of mollusks at uh, www.naturespot.org. Um, if you happen to be watching this video and you're not in Naturespot and Rutland, the place to go is www.brc ac.uk slash iRecord and you can submit uh, records there from anywhere in the United Kingdom but Leicestershire and Rutland records uh, should come through Nature Spot please. So um, thanks um, I, I hope we've got some questions um, I, I've got a question I'd like to kick off with for you Dave um, and that is it, 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 it sort of it seems counterintuitive that the garden snail is not the most frequently um, recorded species. Do you think it's it's not the most popular species um, or do you think uh, there is something to do with uh, recording bias or recording artifacts? Do you think there's another explanation? Well I guess not everybody records from their gardens <clears throat> and I think when you're out in the field then uh, the Kentish snail is the one that you'll likely to see most often. Even in dry weather, a lot of mollusks will only appear in, in damp or wet weather, whereas the Kentish snail um, seems to just, just as, as I said earlier, just bury it out. It kind of climbs um, some vegetation and seals itself off in plain sight. And uh, so even when it's sunny, you can see it, whereas other mollusks would be hidden away. Okay. Um, I, I suppose there is, there is a difference between recording from gardens and recording in more rural settings as, as, as well, isn't there? Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Ben. Um, uh, so you talked about the top 20 um, uh, species in your uh, presentation. Ben, Ben's asking, how many species of slugs and snails do we have in Leicestershire and Rutland? Um, in total, about 140. Wow. And, and how many of those would you say were relatively easy to identify? How, how many of them could you do without, say, a microscope or chemical analysis or, or whatever? Um, you could probably do half, um, recognize them in the field. Um, you, there's just a, a small handful that um, can't be separated without dissection. I mean, the Arianata aggregate that we talked about, the two species there, quite a few of the tiny snails um, you have to identify them by looking inside the mouth they have little teeth inside the mouth of the snail and you could do that in the field um, if you've got a good hand lens but sometimes they're only you know two millimeters long some of these tiny snails so uh, you know spotting them in the first place is the challenge never mind identifying them <clears throat> okay thanks um do we have any other questions for Dave? Steve, you wanted to ask a question. Yes, uh, really enjoyed the presentation, Dave. I thought the, in particular at the start, the different angles to look at uh, both slugs and snails when you're recording them in terms of taking photographs was really excellent as well. Um, the question is this, some snails do have like a trap door which they can use to close the aperture. The technical word for it is an operculum. It's not in any of the land snails that we've looked at this morning, but is it as simple as, simple as aquatic species have opercula and uh, uh, others don't, or is there a bit more to it than that? No, so some of the aquatic snails do, uh, like Jenkins spire snail, uh, for example. Um, but many don't. You know, the, the, um, the ram's horn snails and the, 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 the great pond snail, the big pointy one that uh, we all have in our ponds, none of those have the perculum. <clears throat> there is, um, I don't think there's any uh, Leicestershire and Rutland snails that I can think of that have an operculum. There are an odd one uh, that you can find elsewhere, terrestrial snails that have them. Thank you. The, the complication sometimes is if you find empty snail shells by a riverside. If you look through flood debris, for example, which is a great way of picking up aquatic species, you can get you know a dozen different uh, species uh, in in, in uh, flood debris, and you can identify them just from their empty shells. But often the operculum is then lost. 
from the main body of the shell. So if that was a key ID feature, you've lost that as a, as a guide. But in most cases, you can do it without the operculum anyway. So the operculum is actually attached to the soft parts and as it withdraws, it seals the aperture. Yeah, if you ever watch a, a snail with an operculum manipulator, it's fascinating. Yeah, as you say, when it, when it wants to come out for a walk, it, uh, it just kind of thrusts it out to the side and carries it around like a dustbin lid. And then uh, when it wants to protect itself away, it withdraws back into the shell and, and pulls the lid closed. Um, it's, it's quite a clever little protection device. Oh, well, great answer and great analogy to finish with. Thank you. Okay, um, any more questions anyone want to ask? So Ben says his favorite is the leopard slug. Um, you want to say anything about leopard slugs, Dave? And then we'll well, go they're fantastic two. creatures. They're um, one of our largest snails. They're very easy to identify uh, on the whole because they're kind of this pale gray with dark spots on. Um, they are often uh, welcomed in gardens because they have a very wide, diverse diet, which includes other slugs. So uh, many people that want to keep their slug population under control should welcome leopard slugs because they will contribute to that. They don't just eat other slugs, but they eat all sorts of things. Um, but they have this most amazing uh, mating behavior, which I've never seen uh, in the flesh. But uh, if you're interested, Google it. There's some great pictures and, and little videos of it. The, uh, the, the two uh, slugs climb up a tree or, or into a branch and then they, they, they kind of abseil down on a bit of, on a, like a slime rope, both of them together. And then when they're dangling in, in midair, they, they operate this kind of ballet, uh, this, this, this mating ballet, and they both exchange uh, sperm because they're, um, they, but both uh, can, um, can, can lay eggs. So they're, they're, they're hermaphrodites, they, they're both males and females together. And, um, but this, this, uh, this twining of the, of the two slugs at the end of this uh, slime rope is quite amazing. So it's one of those little secrets that is probably happening in a lot of our gardens uh, at night and we just don't see it. But look, look it up on, on, uh, on the web and, it's, uh, and then maybe look for it in your garden sometime. Okay, thanks Dave. Um, I feel like Matt Hancock uh, chairing a press conference. Uh, so now we've got a question from a member of the public. We've got a question from Sue in Leicestershire. Um, so <laughs> Sue, what's your question? Uh, can you, you hear me all right this time? You did. Um, it was about the garlic snail, actually. Um, I found um, I found a garlic scented snail in um, Bagworth, um, but I was looking on. I think it must have been Brian Evershed's keys, actually, um, and it did suggest that, that another snail might be garlic scented. I think it's Navaricus oxycarlus Navaricus, it, and I couldn't work out what the difference was, to be honest. Do, I mean, is that something you've come across? Yeah, that that is true. Um, th there are one or two other snails that have a very weak garlic uh, smell. I mean, the, this, this, the garlic chemical um, is is not uncommon in nature. It's used by plants as well, uh, you know, as as a kind of deterrent to being eaten. I mean, we might like garlic, but clearly, you know, birds and things probably don't. Um, but it's such a strong smell from the garlic snail it's much greater than you would get from uh, the varicus. The, the other snails can, that, that uh, produce the garlic smell um, can be more easily identified as well and separated. The, the, the best way is just to look at the, the gallery and the information on Nature Sport which would describe those differences. I'll, I'll post it on Nature Spot and see what you think then. <laughs> yeah please do. It, it was quite garlicky. Um, I didn't say earlier, I was a bit late to the meeting, but I thought that was really good, Dave. I, I thought it was absolutely excellent. So, Thank you. Uh, really clear and good resources. Uh, I'm, hope, I'm assuming everyone else agrees with that. Okay, thanks. And uh, we've got, well, I think we'll take one more question from uh, Graham. Uh, Graham, uh, do you want to ask your question? Hi, Dave. <clears throat> you, Hi. Mentioned, you mentioned flood debris as a good place to search. Have you got uh, any other places that you usually check out for snails or slugs? Yeah, whenever I'm out and about, um, I turn over 
any kind of logs or stones that I find. Um, the one thing which um, I think explains why many of the species aren't recorded very often is, is simply their size and they're hard to see. Many of these uh, very small snails, um, they just get into little kind of cracks and crevices and they're quite hard to spot. And particularly if you're in a woodland where the light's not very bright, you have to look uh, carefully. Um, but with very few exceptions, uh, all mollusks need to live in damp, humid environments. So um, unless you're out in the rain and few of us record in the rain, then um, you have to think where the, the slugs and snails are going to be when it's drier weather. And they, they will tuck themselves away um, where, where, where they can keep damp. So that's mainly under logs and, and, and stones. So just turn them over and see what you can find. There's a few species when it gets really dry, they will bury themselves down into the soil. Some of them can go quite deep, particularly in gardens actually, things like um, uh, the, the Budapest slug, uh, Tandonia, um, which is very common in gardens, will bur bury itself, down. it'll go down uh, an earthworm hole and, 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 and try and keep itself really damp well under the earth. But many don't do that, or, or you can find them at the surface, providing they're under cover. So just turn over a few logs. Okay, um, I think we'll um, wind it up now uh, for, for the recording. So um, thanks once again very much, Dave. Um, great resources that you've shared. Lots of resources on the Nature Spot website that people can use to identify various mollusks. And just a reminder it, that the, the, all of the mollusks are a seriously under-recorded group. We would like a lot more records. Uh, Leicestershire and Rutland to naturespot.org.uk and um, any other records from the UK via iRecord. So um, thanks once again, Dave, for a great presentation and thanks to everyone else for participating.